My name is Lisa Kelly. I'm board president of Mental Health Awareness of Michiana. Uh, welcome to Teen Substance Abuse, How to Have Difficult Conversations in Today's Culture with our speaker, Alicia Wells. Uh, we're delighted uh, that Alicia is here tonight with us and sharing you know, her experience and her expertise. So this, this uh, webinar will last about an hour. And uh, I think that there'll be conversation, there'll be questions uh, that will be woven into the presentation. Um, we, because this is a webinar format, we cannot see the participants, um, you know, all of you. But if you post questions to the Q&A or to the chat box, we will get to those uh, during the presentation. So um, I, as far as MHAM goes, I know we have people who've attended our webinars before. But Mental Health Awareness of Michiana is a nonprofit whose mission is to improve the lives of uh, folks in Michiana who are suffering from mental illness or have mental health concerns. And one of our initiatives is educational. So we, we uh, host webinars and hopefully we'll be doing in-person events uh, as you know, things progressively get better uh, in Michiana. But we also have found that the webinars are a great way to connect with people beyond um, our immediate area. So we welcome folks from, uh, from all over the state and we've had participants from different parts of the country as well. Uh, but most of our folks are coming from St. Joe County, Elkhart County, and even Marshall and Laporte County as well. So um, I'm gonna introduce Alicia. Alicia Wells is a treatment advocate for Recovery Centers of America for, um, well, she can tell us the change that she's about to go through, as well as the founder of two local nonprofits, Recover Michiana Fest and FANS, which is Fresh Attitudes for New Success. Alicia is a certified peer recovery coach and a person in long-term recovery. In all aspects of Alicia's personal and professional life, she's passionate about helping individuals find their unique pathway to recovery from substance abuse disorder, as well as supporting and educating their loved ones throughout the process. As someone who has personally navigated both incarceration and substance abuse, substance abuse disorder, she utilizes the hard-won knowledge gained from her experiences to offer non-judgmental, compassionate guidance as she connects clients and families to treatment options in lieu of or in addition to our incarceration. Alicia is a graduate of the 2018 cohort for the SPARK program, a member of the Women Business Owners of Michiana, and participates on the review board for Dismiss House of South Bend, she is a devoted wife and mother and a loyal friend who always celebrates the successes of those around her. Alicia's vision for Michiana is to create a resilient community where all recovery related organizations and the judicial system network together to make treatment easier to access and to reduce barriers to successful reentry after incarceration. So Alicia, we welcome you and we thank you for being here to talk about teen substance abuse and the difficult conversations uh, that we, we as parents all need to have in today's culture. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and I thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, for those who couldn't pick up on that, I did not write that intro, um, which it's uh, really humbling. Um, the question is why me? Right? I don't have a lot of extensive letters um, next to my name, but I love to say that I have an MLE. I have a master's in life experience. I've lived what we're talking about tonight. I was uh, a teenager that got addicted to prescription pain medication. Um, and I grew up in a family where that would have normally not happened. I was raised by my mom and dad who were married, living under the same house. Uh, I had a brother that was in the military. On paper, um, I looked like the all-American traditional family. But what laid underneath the surface was this family dynamic um, of, a, of a long, long history of addiction on both sides um, that my parents thought they were doing the right thing um, and sheltered me from really kind of knowing about which we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, I'm here um, because I believe in our community. I believe in our kids. 
Um, and I want to support you as parents that are walking this treacherous road because things are not what they were when we were teenagers. Um, I, want, I want to start this out um, and I thought I was going to get to see you, right? And I don't. Um, and I wanted it to be an interactive question. So if you'll go with me down memory lane for just a second, I want you to go back to your teenage years. Um, the average 15 year old right now was born in 2006. I don't know about you, but I almost choked when I read that today. I'm like, there's no way I'm that old, right? Um, there's no way 15 year olds um, were born in 2006, but that's just the facts. And so when we look at where we were as teenagers, if we look at the year, let's just take year um, in the 90s, maybe you grew up in the 90s, the drugs that we had to worry about in the 90s were marijuana was the top one, cocaine, maybe some meth and maybe heroin. Um, but at the time it was pure heroin that we had to worry about or that we heard about um, as teenagers, okay? Uh, LSD, maybe a little acid depending. In 2000, we were dealing with things like more marijuana, which higher potency, right? It's not the same marijuana from the 60s. It sure as heck not the same marijuana from the 90s, but it was this more potent marijuana in 2000s. And we were looking at cocaine, methamphetamine, Vicodin, you know, pills, um, Xanax, Adderall. Um, we were looking at a bunch of different kinds of new medications, right? And I know if you're like me, you always heard drugs are drugs and you always picture some strange person standing on the corner and you knew to kind of avoid that or you knew certain areas, but you never understood how drugs could get into our families, our loved ones, our lives. I wanna to talk to you a little bit and tell you my story so you can kind of understand where I am and where I came from. In, I graduated in the year 2000. Um, I was a senior in high school when I developed um, a knee injury, a left knee injury uh, in track and cheerleading. I was very active in high school. I was president of Students Against Drunk Driving. I knew to say no to drugs. I knew that it was bad. Uh, I even walked home from junior prom. My dad picked me up because my prom date was smoking pot. So that was what they called kind of a prude. I got made fun of for that actually. I was also diagnosed at the same time with endometriosis, uh, which is a female um, condition and at the time, they didn't know what they know now. And I was prescribed pain pills after pain pills after pain pills. I would go to the doctor and they would just give me more. And I remember having my first knee surgery and the pain was unbearable and they gave me pain pills. And I remember taking them and feeling funny, but never understanding what I was about to face. I know that day, if a doctor would have looked at my mother and said, uh, Mrs. Rushing, I am, prescribing your daughter synthetic heroin, my mother would have laughed in his face and said, she'll be fine with the time, right? But my mom didn't know, and we trusted the process. This was back in 2000. Looking ahead and fast forwarding into 2003, it was completely hooked on pain medications and they took over my life in a way that I could have never expected. I was going to college, um, I had dreams, I had aspirations, but I remember the day that I was addicted I remember the day that I knew I couldn't stop taking them. And it was, I was sitting on a couch, Regis and Kelly was on, had a good job, was going to school. And I was willing to give all of that up just for the sound of the bottle, the shaking of the pills in the bottle. That took me on a really long path. And when I say a long path, all the way up until 2013, 10 years of my life was consumed by drug addiction. It was consumed by in and out of incarceration, family just was devastated. My family didn't even know how to respond to something such as this. Um, I did dare, my parents talked to me. How did this happen, you know? My parents just couldn't understand. Um, looking back, there was a few things we could have done, but I, I, there's no ill will towards my parents. There was, they were uneducated. They had no idea what, the, what we were dealing with. And so that's why I make it my mission to come on and talk with individuals such as yourself that take time out of your night to find out what can we do to better our community and what can we do to better our children? 
you know, I always say it starts at home, right? It starts with us learning and reading and, 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 and trying to figure out the best ways and staying up to date. And I'm here to tell you drugs and the drugs that are out there now, what we're dealing with is, is, is fentanyl, carfentanyl, cocaine, synthetic marijuana, bath salts. We are not dealing with the drugs of 2000. We're dealing with the drugs right now in 2021. I've been walking in long-term recovery since 2013, and I'm going to tell you that the process has not been easy. I came to find long-term recovery through long-term incarceration. In 2013, I was given the greatest gift of my life, and that was my son. And four months after giving birth, because I was on MAT and it wasn't done appropriate, and MAT stands for Medicated Assisted Treatment, um, I relapsed. And I went to prison when my son was four months old. What mother does that? I spent the next four years getting my life together, knowing that I was going to come home. And if God was willing to save me like he did, I knew that I was supposed to come home and share my story with you. It's not easy to get on here and admit that I used when I was pregnant. It's not easy to get on here and be vulnerable with you, but I know that you need to hear it so that you can see why I'm here tonight and why I care what happens to your sons and your daughters and how I'm here to help. Uh, I appreciate you letting me be vulnerable and share my story with you. And I'm, op I'm an open book. You can ask any questions. If any bit of my experience can help you, I want you to ask. You may not feel comfortable asking me tonight and that's okay. I put my phone number right there in the chat box. That is my personal number. What we talk about stays between us. Use me as a resource, put me in your phone. My phone's always on. Our community depends on us working together and the safety and security of our children. Um, I like to say drugs aren't welcome in our community but they find a way there anyway. So I'm gonna make it a point to make sure that we're working hard to get them out. Um, when I was talking about um, the remember when, when you remember to the drugs that were, that were prevalent when you were in high school and we're looking at the drugs that we're facing today, I want you to remember the name fentanyl. Fentanyl is right now being considered a weapon of mass destruction. It really is um, because it's taking lives at rapid rates. I wanna give you right where we're at right now. What are we facing right now? Um, according to the New York Times, and I, I'm gonna send some of these in and you guys can definitely look, look all of this up. US drug overdoses soared 30% in 2020. And what does that mean? 93,331 individuals, sons and daughters, husbands and wives, mothers and fathers passed away from drug overdose with an increase of 54% 54% in 2019, 54%. Just in St. Joe County alone, preliminary numbers for 2019 were 37 overdose deaths. In 2020, preliminary numbers, 77. Fentanyl, what is fentanyl? How do our kids get a hold of fentanyl? All the drugs that are coming in right now are done in pill presses and laced with fentanyl. And it just takes a very, very, very small amount of fentanyl and carfentanyl to create an accidental overdose. What we used to consider experimenting is now killing our children. I think we all know, and we've heard in our community the story of the Savage Boys, accidental overdose. We hear stories and stories like that all over the country, all over our community, kids that don't know because they're not really talking about it. So it's our job as parents, our job as mentors, our job as counselors and therapists to make sure that we're educating our children with what they're really dealing with. And that includes their family history. I wanna talk about Parenting as a team. I know what it's like to be a divorced parent. Uh, through my addiction and incarceration, although I'm married now, I'm divorced 
from my son's father. And I know that we have to work together as a team and that's not always easy and it's not always something that we can do. But I wanna share with you from the drug-free organization, I'm gonna pull this up really quick. And again, I will reference, um, it's important to be on the same page with the parent or with anybody in the household about the expectations of drugs in your household, which means do not be a home that hosts under any circumstances. We do not wanna set the precedence that it's okay for our children to come into our home and use anything, any substance, because once we give them an inch, we know what's gonna happen next. We are setting the precedence for what's allowed in our homes and it's so important to be on the same page to not be a host. The consequences are too great. You don't wanna be that parent that finds that accidental overdose because you wanted to be more of a friend than a parent. Um, I know there's many, many things that we're not gonna be able to tap into uh, tonight. Um, it's a 45 minute conversation. Um, and I wanna leave time for questions and um, comments. I, I wanna hear what you, I wanna hear what you think. Um, but when we talk about parenting as a team, we're talking about making sure that we have a conversation with each other about being on the same page. What are the expectations of your household? Before you can ever have a conversation with your child, you need to be talking about what are the expectations in my household? What am I gonna allow? What am I not going to allow? Realizing that if drugs end up in your home, it, it, it's not something you did wrong. It's not that you're to blame. This isn't, this isn't a blame game. And we see that quite a bit. It's really important that you pledge to not undermine each other, right? Because dad may have a different idea than what mom does. And there's this like strong, when we start wavering, it gives our, room, our children room to waver as well. Always be mindful to come from a place of love, even when you're angry, even if you have to take 10 minutes because you heard something happened. That's super, super important. Children are more likely to continue to talk to us when we are calm than if we are yelling at them and screaming at them. I remember when my parents first found out that I was addicted, they showed up at my house at 11 o'clock at night banging on the door because I had taken some medication from somebody and my parents found out about it. And instead of us getting to the root of the problem, right? we were dealing with the anger and the frustration and, and letting people down when we should have been talking about me getting the help that I needed. Again, no blame to my parents. They were walking this path. They didn't have a seminar or a webinar to go to. They had nobody to talk to because it was so taboo. I wanna talk about where are these drugs coming from? Um, oh, one more thing before I, before I leave this whole United Front. Be prepared to be called a hypocrite, right? Your kids are going to be like, you experimented. Why can't I? You did this or you smoke cigarettes or you drink alcohol or you do this. Why can't I? The fact remains you're an adult of age and you can make your own decisions. However, you also need to remind your children that although you may experiment it 25 years ago, we're not dealing with the same kind of drugs from 25 days ago. And you're not willing to risk their life for car fentanyl and fentanyl. I wanna talk about right now, our kids are facing epidemic of, of just crazy, crazy proportions. And I get a lot of people that say, marijuana, it's legal in Michigan. It's not legal for children of any age, first of all. And secondly, regardless if you believe that it cures cancer or that it's a good medicinal purposes, which I'm not here to argue, that is not my thing. I'm sure there are studies that prove different. I'm here to tell you that a child using marijuana leads to other things. I'm here to tell you that a child using marijuana, it affects their brains, their study for that. And when we start opening the door for marijuana, which the marijuana today is also laced and could be laced with carfentanil or fentanyl or meth or who knows what else, we need to think about what are we allowing our children to do that's going to be a gateway for what's to come. I know a lot of people may disagree with me on marijuana being a gateway drug. As an adult, maybe, maybe not. It's not for me to say. 
As a child, I'm here to tell you that if you're using one, you're using it to cover something up, masking something up. A child at the age of 14 and 15 years old does not smoke a joint because they wanna relax. We have to recognize why our children may be wanting to use. So how do we have these conversations, right? We, let, let's, let's say Ashley, right? Ashley comes home. Ashley's your daughter. Ashley's not acting like herself and she's been hanging out with her friend, Sarah, and they're fighting and they're, you know, the total, typical teenage drama. And it comes out that Sarah may be using drugs, right? How do you even begin to have that conversation? As a parent, you can't say, you're not hanging out with Sarah anymore because the first thing they're gonna do is hang out with Sarah and you become the enemy. It's conversation. It's showing them the consequences of what could come. And if you have a family history of substance abuse or alcoholism, that needs to be talked about with your child from a very young age. They need to understand that they're growing up with a predisposition to continuously be addicted. And that's just facts. I had such a strong family addiction on both sides to alcoholism and substance abuse that my parents thought they were doing a very good job from sheltering me from those particular family members. When in fact, I had no idea that this could trickle into me and that this I was made from the same DNA. Would there be a different outcome had I known that? I don't know, but I know that I'm going to tell my son that he is way more likely to become addicted. I am seeing a question about being muted. Can, oh, okay. Can everybody hear me though? Am I, am I muted? I'm just gonna, oh, okay, perfect. So I know that I'm gonna have that conversation with my son and let him know. Those are tough things. We don't wanna talk about our past and grandma and grandpa and aunt and uncles, but suicide comes right along with this. If you have family members that have committed suicide, you really should be talking to your children about that. When we hide things, they come out always. And when they come out, they come out guns blaring. So I wanna talk about what do we do if we see that our uh, Ashley and Sarah, we're gonna to continue to use Ashley and Sarah, that there's drugs being used. Maybe it's marijuana. Maybe you found an alcohol bottle, right? Maybe you came across something that you know is not right. What do you do? Do you sit them down and say, I know that you're using. I know that you're doing something or do you just pretend like it doesn't exist? Well, I know every single one of us would raise our hands right now and we'd say, I would confront this situation, but then in the back of our minds would be like, oh, but this is gonna be an argument. I'm not even sure how. Tonight, we're gonna post some things and I'm gonna have, I'm gonna walk through them with you. Um, you're gonna have access to all of this. And again, I'm a reference um, from here on out, but I wanna talk about the, um, one second here, on, on how to start that conversation and what does that look like? You wanna always be honest. I know you're doing this. Um, if you're using you know, vaping or tobacco or any of those things, say, I know you're using it. It's not okay. How long have you been using it? Make sure you get to the bottom of how long, what are they using? Where did they get it from? And they may not be so quick to tell you those things, but I'm gonna give you some instruction on how to figure out where that stuff's coming from, okay? It's important that if you find evidence, you gather the evidence and you take the evidence to the table. Here you go, explain that. And it, potentially they're gonna say, it's Sarah's, or I don't know where that came from. They know where it came from. Be, don't give up and get to the bottom of it. I wanna talk about common hide in places that uh, our teens are using currently. Uh, dresser drawers beneath clothing, desk drawers, small boxes, jewelry boxes, pencil boxes, Kleenex boxes. I can tell you uh, a Kleenex box. I used to hide my bottle of pills down in a Kleenex box that sat on my dresser and my mom never knew. 
I change my Kleenex box. Um, under a bed in the plant buried in the dirt, especially if they're in little baggies, between books, some books are even cut out so that drugs can fit in in the book. Uh, Harry Potter books are actually a huge one that I've seen. Um, in containers that are designed to conceal fake lipsticks, fake soda cans, et cetera. Now I wanna to talk to you about uh, an organization called Hidden in Plain Sight. The 525 Foundation is actually bringing Hidden in Plain Sight to St. Joe County to in October. So mark this on your calendars, check it out. The 525 is bringing Hidden in Plain Sight. You're gonna be able to walk through a set up teenage bedroom and find all the tricks in the trade and kind of see for yourself what you're able to do. Becky Savage is doing phenomenal things um, in our education and prevention front. Uh, her and Sarah. Always check if you have, if your kid has Tylenol bottles laying around the room, check, make sure that they're really Tylenol. You can tell by the markings on the pill, Google it, find out. I will tell you if your child is getting a hold of fake pills, they're all fentanyl. They're not real pills that they're buying on the street. Um, our medicine cabinets are where our children are getting stuff. I don't know if you've ever heard of Scissorp. Scissorp is um, anytime you go to the doctor and you get um, prescription cough medicine um, that's mixed with Sprite uh, and a Jolly Rancher, they shake it up and it's called Scissor. And it's a new, not even really that new, but it's a trending thing that they use. Um, they drink mouthwash. Um, we've seen a lot of teenagers using mouthwash. We've seen them, you, you know, putting the classic you know, putting water back into the bottles and that kind of thing. But we're seeing an uptake of teenagers getting a hold of fake pills. And that's what's killing them. I can, I can tell you right now, and I want to give you this. In 2019, 200 moms a day got a call in 2020, the status says 250 moms a day. Those are staggering numbers. I don't want you to be that mom. I don't wanna be that mom. 85% are from fentanyl poisoning, an accidental overdose. I know many people are afraid to try to start getting help for their teenager because where are they gonna go? What's gonna happen? Is this gonna be marked on them forever? Are they gonna be labeled an addict forever? Is this gonna follow them? I would rather be labeled an addict for the rest of my life than have died the day that I could have. There are things that you can still do and live and it's a story, but there are millions of people that are living in sobriety and they're young people in recovery. And we have an amazing organization in St. Joe County to get your children and young adults connected to. It's called YPN. Again, I'll make sure you guys have that resource if you want it. When you're talking to your children, I want you to expect anger, but resolve to remain calm. I had somebody who's never even walked in addiction tell me, Alicia, addiction is a chaotic disease. Yeah. When our teenagers are using mind altering substances, they're not the most pleasant individuals to be around. That's a sign. If Ashley comes home and she's angry and she's frustrated and things are changing, and of course, you know, you're gonna have the teenage drama, but you can just tell something is going on and it's not to be ignored. There are resources out there for you to contact, to even help walk you through an intervention. Interventional is know how to get the information extracted if you are not comfortable doing it. And I'm here to tell you, I will come over and help you talk to your child any day of the week because I'd rather come and do that than go to their funeral. And that is the reality of the situation. If the conversation gets heated once you confront your child, I want you to remember to take a pause and then pick it back up. And that's gonna lead us into having the safe word for your child, right? We know our kids are gonna go out. We know they're gonna be with friends. We know they've been taught say no to drugs. They know that they have a family history. They know that they 
can access it, but they don't want to. Be their advocate. What does that mean? It means a safe word. It could be charger. It could be yellow. It could be your dog's name, cat's name, whatever it is, platypus, if you want it to be. Have a safe word that your teenager can text you anytime, day or night, and you know that you've got to go get them. Be their ride. And I'm here to tell you, my father was my ride. And I'll never, ever forget it. He wanted to ask so many questions that night, but he didn't. And I don't encourage you to ask questions that night. Have a cool down period. They're safe. You know, they're home, whatever the case is. Pick it up in the morning and start it with, Ashley, I'm so proud of you that you texted me last night. I'll come anywhere to get you, any time of day. But I, I just want to know what happened. Oh, I don't want to talk about it. I get that, Ashley. I get it. You don't want to talk about it. It's stressful. And I know you're afraid that I may not like whoever you're hanging around. That's going to be your decision to make. But I'm here to tell you that we, we need to talk about this. And this is when we bring up the realities of what drug mewling looks like. And our children and female populations are being driven and drug into this in more and more ways. They get connected with these friendships and they've got cars. And somebody says, can you drive to Elkhart? Can you drop something off? Can you pick me up? Can you? We should be encouraging our children to know who they're with because these girls are picking up packages or they're driving in their car because they're helping a friend and they're getting 10 and 15 years. I can tell you from doing time in the Indiana Department of Corrections, there was a 19 year old side bunkie of mine. She liked a boy, he was cute. And all he needed her to do was take his friend over to the store. Would she wait? Sure, I'll wait. She did eight years for accessory to armed robbery. Our kids don't even know what they're getting themselves into. And you're like, Alicia, I don't want to scare my child at dinner every night. But the fact is your child is on TikTok and Snapchat, and those are circulars that are getting into their mind and they can order drugs right from there. Social media targets our children. Snapchat is a huge thing right now where our children are getting accessible or access, if you will, to the drugs immediately, and they're being delivered to your door. And what are they being delivered in? A baseball cap. That's got an underside liner through a clothing company, which I'm going to tag you today um, on some clothing companies that are known for high, having drug hiding capabilities. It's sneaky. It's like a roaring lion waiting to pounce on our children. And it's our job to be diligent and to have those conversations. I want to go back to the morning after when you're talking to your child and you're like, listen, I, I want to know what happened. I'm not ready to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Okay. But we're going to talk about it. And the reason why we're going to talk about it is because I trust you to make the right decision. You made the right decision last night. I want to talk about it. We need to be the voice of reason in a time where it's so unreasonable in their minds. The pressure to fit in, the pressure to be TikTok famous, the pressure just to go to high school. There were some statistics that I wanted to pull up for you tonight that were just astonishing uh, to me. And uh, I'm going to pull that up for you. Thank you for your patience. But that was the, the previous thing that I was talking about is finding real opportunities for conversation. You know, if you see something in the newspaper, if you see something on the news, if you hear of another student, use that opportunity as a time for conversation on what the consequences could be. I often get told I'm harsh because I will look at somebody and say, you will die. Those are the facts. Those are 
the worst case scenario is you could die. And I am not willing to risk that by just looking the other way because my teen is being a teen. I want to talk about the empathy and the support real quick before I get to the statistics, but having empathy that being a teenager is a lot tougher than even when it was for us. Times are changing, things are happening. Our society is in an upheaval, regardless on what side of the aisle you sit in. Our children are faced with loneliness and connecting through screens. They tell us not to have our, our kids on screen time longer than eight hours a day. And many of them, they did schooling eight hours a day. There's so much back and forth. And we have this opportunity to, to look at what they're doing. It is important as parents that we are diligent on their Snapchats, their TikToks, their Facebooks. What are they posting? What are the secret accounts that you don't know about? We've got to take the time because if we don't take the time to educate our children, I guarantee you they're being educated by somebody else and they don't have the right information. The kids aren't sitting around saying, carfentanil kills. They don't even know what they're doing. They think it's a Xanax. Grandma and grandpa's medicine cabinets, Aunt Sue's medicine cabinet, they're playgrounds for disaster. So I'm gonna encourage you to do spring cleaning, fall cleaning of your medicine cabinet. If, if you're not using a medication, get rid of it. Do the medication DEA day, take back days. Um, contact the 525 Foundation for Jatera pouches. Destroy your medications before they get into the hands of somebody who gets addicted to that and then finds an online pharmacy out of Mexico. It's gonna send them their stuff. And you think if stuff's being sent to my house, I know, not necessarily. And this talk isn't meant to scare you and, and, and make you fearful and be like, wow, what now? Come on, this can't be real. It's real. And we're talking about it tonight in a safe environment to where if we have questions, we can ask them. If you're mentoring children, it's important to just be a safe space to ask questions. Are kids using drugs in your school? because I'm here to tell you there, the statistics that I was looking for, and I just didn't want to look um, and take away from you, is that there are, every kid knows somebody who's a dealer. By 10th grade, they know. They may not use them, they may not even hang around that person, but they know who to go to. This is insanity that we're dealing with. And it's so much different than the walk that we walked. And it was hard when we walked it, right? And so many people can say, well, I used in high school and I put it down and I'm fine. My kid will be too. I can socially drink. I'm not an alcoholic. My kid will be too. We don't know what's in what they're using. We cannot afford to look the other way. Your kid may hate you for a minute. They're not going to be happy with you. You're going to be the enemy. You're going to be the hypocrite. You're going to be the narcissist. You're going to be the mother that never allows them to do anything. But at the end of the day, when we're diligent and we give them the space to make decisions for themselves while we're educating them through the process, that only lasts for a little while. Then they begin to turn around and thank you. The alternative side to that is that they're not here to thank you. I, I love the safe word. I hope that you'll use the safe word. If you take anything away from tonight, it's the safe word. And knowing that when you have this conversation with your, this is a great entryway. Hey, listen, Ashley, I know that it's hard out there. And I know that you're going to have to make some really tough decisions. I want to give you an out. I want you to know that I'm here for you. I want you to know that you can text this word to me and I'm coming. 
by even just having that conversation to open the door that they know that they can count on you as mom and dad, you're not going to get into it that night. They don't have to tell you all the nitty and gritty because you may not like it, that the conversation is still going to happen, but that they can call you. I get a lot of calls where a boy or a girl were in a relationship and there was some drug use. And the mom says, it's all because of Joan. Maybe so. But this is an opportunity for you to edify your child by saying you make decisions that are going to affect your life. You, I mean, colleges are looking at social media. Our kids aren't even understanding the, the digital footprint that they're gonna have. And to be honest with you, our kids are not all that bright sometimes and they post stuff on social media that, that gives it all away. So monitor your social media accounts for your children. I highly encourage it. I, um, I'm so excited that I got to be here tonight and I want to give you a few resources to reach out. If you want more information, if you are already dealing with this topic in your home and you're worried that your teen is struggling with substance abuse disorder and you're not really sure what to do, I encourage you to reach out to Mental Health Michiana, first and foremost. I encourage you to call SAMHSA, the number uh, I will put in the chat box, but it's 1-800-662-4357. Indiana has a hotline of 211 that you can call. You can always call me. You have resources at your disposal. We're here to help. I will tell you that uh, this is my last week with Reco um, Recovery Centers of America. Um, I am now taking time to focus on South Bend, Mishawaka and Elkhart. Uh, I am now taking a position as the community event coordinator for Fort Wayne Recovery and Allendale Detox and Treatment Center in Fort Wayne. And I'm gonna be able to really focus on home and put some recovery events, more community awareness events. I'll be out there. I'm always willing to talk to your child. I'm willing to go to lunch. I'm willing to have coffee. I'm willing to meet with you. I'm willing to share my story and the consequences that robbed me of 10 years of my life. I'm thankful I have my life and I want our children to have theirs. The stuff we're dealing with guys is so dangerous and I can't stress that enough. And I'm ready with you to help our kids. I thank you so much for this opportunity tonight to be here and to share and to just be vulnerable and to tell you the nitty gritty of what's really going on. And boots on the ground, seeing it, as a certified peer recovery coach called out to overdoses, hearing about a lot of suicides. COVID took its toll on our kids and their mental health, on adults and their mental health. If you or a loved one are struggling, maybe you are, who knows? You don't have to do it alone. Recovery Michiana, myself, Mental Health America, we're here, we're not going anywhere, no judgment, you matter, your kids matter, and we're gonna do this. If you're interested in helping me join the fight, we're always looking for volunteers, I'd love to have you. Um, and I now at 6.45, I went over 6.46, sorry, uh, wanna open it up for comments and questions um, please, uh, anything you think or any questions that you have. So Alicia, um, as I'm, a, I've just asked if anybody has questions to please type it into the chat. Um, can I start with a question? Uh, you know, sometimes it's hard for parents of teenagers, uh, to know what are the right consequences if they've kind of set some guidelines for their kids 
and the kids lie about, you know, where they might have been or, you know, what they might have been doing. So I don't know what advice you have for parents. I mean, the communication I'm hearing, you know, open communication is key. But in terms of setting, you know, consequences, appropriate consequences for teenagers, do you have any, um, any ideas or feedback on that? So my feedback and my opinion um, for consequences for teenagers is, is already knowing the expectations going into it. Um, knowing that you have to set boundaries for your household. If you lie, I can't trust you. Therefore, I can't give you leeway to go and do what it is you want to do. Right. If you're out past time and you're driving, you're not going to be driving. If you're caught texting and driving, you're not going to be driving. There's very clear. It's just like having in a work environment. There are expectations that get you a bonus. There's expectations that get you here. If you fail to meet those expectations, there are consequences. So reasonable consequences are not month long groundings. Those those do not work. Okay, first of all, but taking away electronic devices, that'll get their attention. Um, put, you know, TED Talks are my favorite. Oh, I love TED Talks. Use those all day long. You want to go and be out drinking? Here you go. Watch a TED Talk. Here you go. There's always some great things on the web that you can use um, to educate your child. Use that as an opportunity to educate your child on what the consequences could be farther outside of just the home. Right. I know a mom who is struggling with her son sneaking out of the house and stealing her car. She ended up having to report him in to the juvenile probation department because she knew that if he hit somebody and he wrecked the car and he killed somebody, it was going to be far greater than getting him the consequences right away. I'm here to report he's doing much better and he learned and it does suck. I'm not, I'm not here to always say get the justice system involved. But it, if it, it is serious nature, we cannot show our children that we cover up their behavior. That's called enabling. We have to hold them accountable to the decisions that they choose to make, right or wrong. That would be my feedback. Thank you. I hope that helps a little. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I, I love that idea that you set clear expectations and the consequences are coming out of that. And that it's not even anything that you're doing in anger. Listen, you got your driver permit. If you drive when I'm not in the car, you will not drive. You will not get your license at 16. That way when, hey, this world, you made that choice. You're holding them accountable. You made a choice. If you're going to sneak and I find drugs in the house, you are going to talk to a therapist. You're going to talk to a counselor. We are going to look at why you're wanting to do this. If it's for recreational purposes, maybe work on trying to find them something new. I do know a family that was struggling with that and they put their daughter in some other things and the daughters, you know, you've got to find them a new purpose. You've got to get them in new crowds because it's a dangerous situation. And as parents, we have to help navigate that, but hold them accountable to the decisions that they're making. Does anybody else have questions? Kristen is saying uh, that you are an inspiration and thank you for your presentation. So it's true, you are an inspiration, Alicia. And uh, I don't know if anybody else has any questions. Uh, for I hope so. It's a or great opportunity. It's a great opportunity. Um, and I don't wanna, I have other questions, but I don't wanna dominate this, so. <clears throat> All right, I will while I'm waiting for other people to ask questions. What would have made a difference to you, Alicia, when you were a teenager and you found yourself, um, uh, you know, kind of going down this road? What do you think would have made a difference to you as a teenager? Addressing the problem head on and not letting it fester. Um, I wish we would have addressed the problem right when there was a problem. Um, so many times we think we can kind of handle it on our own or the, the teen says they're not going to do it again. I wish my parents would have helped me address the problem um, and get me off the drugs earlier. Um, but again, no blame to them. They really didn't know what they were dealing with at the time, but addressing the problem would have made a huge difference. Uh, the outcomes would have been significantly different. Who knows what treatment would have looked like had I had the opportunity to go to treatment um, I don't know. I, I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty, 
uh, definitely feeling like I, I knew I could talk to my parents, but I was I didn't want to. I wanted to stay secret. I wanted to stay hidden. And how do you, uh, I see that there's a question about what are good ways to start the conversations with preteens? And that's easy. Talk about what they're seeing on TikTok. Talk about what they're seeing with their friends. Um, bring up news articles. It's, it's very easy. We see a news article all the time where we see something and we can be like, hey, you know, did you see this? And they'll be like, oh, mom, I never would do such a thing. I can't, no, 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 I know that, I know that. Have you seen this? This is what's out there right now. And letting them kind of just start talking or when something comes up and they're talking about, oh, so-and-so, you know, they're fighting again, blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. Well, what do you think about that? Put it back. The only way our preteens are gonna learn how to make decisions for themselves is if they process the information. And sometimes let's be real, our preteens are full of crap. Like you're just like, how did you miss that? How did you forget the left sock or your right shoe? Like, how do we expect them to process, say no to drugs and all the things they're facing? That's so, why it's so imperative to know who our kids are hanging out with and where they're going. Who, whose parents are around. It's so important that although we wanna give our kids the freedom to be alone a little bit, that we don't leave them alone with people we don't know. Cause we don't know what they're being told and taught is okay. So just questions, what do you think of this? You know, we're gonna hear stories all the time of, you know, this friend or that friend, get involved, know what's going on. And don't be afraid to take them to advocacy events. Don't be afraid to show up at recovery fests and fairs and festivals and, and talk about it so that they know this is out there. Half the problem and half the battle is understanding what our resources are and, and knowing how to find them. There's a question uh, Lilia has about the clothing brands that you mentioned, pushing drugs. Yes, uh, I can actually give the names of those clothing brands to you right now. I wrote them down. It's called um, A-P-E-R-T-U-R-E, -E, Aperture. They have stash spots and a clothing company called Seedless. Again, I'm gonna send um, the link right now to all of these articles that I've referenced tonight. And there's four different clothing companies that you can look at if your child's ordering clothes from these individuals or whatever that you can see, and they're known as stash spots. Uh Kiana is saying, uh, we talk about things like vaping all the time. I still caught the 13 year old vaping. He got sick and that's how we found out. Okay, so he wasn't being honest. So there needs to be consequences for not being honest. And then why is he vaping? Where is he getting it? That's gonna be key. Finding out the answer, where is he getting it? Who's giving this to him? And don't be afraid to walk up to that person and be like, are you, you know, I, you, sometimes, Mama bear's got to come out. Who's giving my 13 year old vaping? And are they vaping THC? Are they vaping just tobacco? Letting your child know what the consequences are. I would show them videos all day long of popcorn lung. And again, I don't have all the right answers. Not everything I say is going to work. Just, I am no parent expert. Lord knows I am not a parent expert. I just know that what I've been through and where I'm at, that you've sometimes just got to be as real as real gets, even if it sounds harsh. You know what? Go ahead, vape. You're 13 years old. You think you're going to take him out running? Make him run. Get him involved in jujitsu where if he doesn't have breath for running, you know, let him feel some of those consequences. Um, that's that's what changes the game is consequences. Uh, okay, so I'm sharing your contact information again, Alicia. Okay. Uh, let's see. I want to send this to you real quick. This note, um, so that you oh. can post it or. Sure. Here's another question. How do you feel about testing teens for nicotine and or drugs on a regular basis or bi-monthly, like monthly or bi-monthly? Do they give you reason to? You uh -huh. can't just go around testing your teen that doesn't show that you trust them and that totally negates the whole I'm giving you the power to make this decision. Now, if they're 
per, you know, continuously doing things and you can't trust them, that could very much be a consequence and a boundary and heck yes, test them all day long. Cause you'd rather test them, know them, get them the help that they need rather than find them later. But I wouldn't, um, uh, I wouldn't test them without reason. Mm -hmm. um, it just shows a lack of trust. But yes, uh, I see as, t as a consequence for getting caught. Yes, if they're doing, not even getting caught so much, if their behavior is changing, if they're not, if they're to the point where you know something's up, you found some evidence, you know something's going on, you can have a conversation. You could say, I'm very concerned about this. There's a lot of stuff going on and this is something that I wanna do. How do you feel about it? And they're gonna be like, don't test me, dad. Don't test me, mom. This is crazy. You don't trust me. You could be like, listen, I've given you ample opportunity. Things have changed. This is A, B, C, and D on why they've changed do this and we won't talk about it. But I, I need to know that you're okay. And the only way that I know that you're okay is if I do this test. But that's only, again, only if their behavior is changing, that you don't want that just to be like something you do in your house. Um, because then it becomes an unsafe place to really talk about any, if they do use or if there is an issue, um, they're not going to feel real comfortable or confident. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a question, but Sydney uh, said that her mom and she had a safe word growing up uh, that she would text and it made an enormous difference in situations where she felt unsafe as a teen. I love this tool for trust and creating a safe space for teens, so. Safe space, yeah. safe space. Um, we've got to create that in order to have open dialogue and conversation. It's just like in our relationships and our marriage, even in our work relationships, we feel comfortable going to our boss when we know it's safe. Um, it's the same with our kids. They just don't, they're little adults that they have all these feelings and emotions, but they don't even know how to process it. And sometimes we as adults expect them to. So that would be my recommendation. And again, just a recommendation. Yep. Alicia, at what point would you bring a professional? Would you get in touch with a professional? Like at what when they test positive? Okay. The first time you find it, the first time they test positive. Mm. Because that's not the first time they used and don't ever believe that. Mm. Okay. Better 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 now than later and then it's impossible to do it. Mm. Okay. Well, Alicia, it is 6.57 and I am going to wrap things up. Um, as I said before, we will post this recording of today's event on our um, MHAM YouTube channel. I will send that link out as well as the resources, Alicia, that you can share with, with the group. So if you send those to me, I'll send it out to our, our participants. Awesome. The other thing is I will send out an evaluation for um, our participants to complete and we do an incentive uh, to hear uh, to try and hear from everybody so there's a little gift card that we'll um, hey. randomly give to people uh, who complete the evaluation or will pull from that group. So um, Alicia, your story is an inspiration. Uh, we really appreciate you know you being vulnerable with us, you sharing um, your expertise and your experience. Um, and as a parent of three, I can tell you that everything that you said, you know, is useful. So it's hard sometimes to be patient uh, as a parent, especially if you see your kids doing things that are dangerous and, you know, really self-destructive. Um, but I, I appreciate, you know, your advice and hopefully we all can um, incorporate it into our parenting. So thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure and I appreciate the safe space to be vulnerable and to share my story. Thank you. And thank you everybody for attending tonight.